Don't be in a, in a race to finish something. Sometimes you got to meditate on God's Word. Sometimes you read a chapter and the next day you got to go back and reread it again. Prayer is our connection to omnipotence. That's why we need to pray. If people don't pray, if Christians don't pray, what is that saying? you lord we know father you're doing things in our hearts and souls even as we wait upon you oh god and we thank you lord jesus we thank you god you're taking care of a lot of those things that we came in with even as we wait in your presence lord jesus we love you lord continue to be with us oh god continue to be with us lord jesus don't leave us don't leave us god be here with us lord jesus father we Thank you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, uh, tonight, um, as I was speaking to Timmy uh, a few days ago, the Lord had dropped a, a real uh, message in his heart, and as I he was sharing it with me, I just knew that... Uh, that we needed to hear it together uh, as a church. So I'm going to invite Timmy to come right now and share what the Lord has put on his heart for tonight. Would you join me in welcoming Timmy Vasquez? Hello. There we go. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Um, it doesn't, uh, happen all that often, and, uh, but, uh, just in the time I was having with the Lord, I was just praying about some things and asking God questions and Him dealing with me in prayer, and, and then it was, uh, very suddenly in the middle of my prayer, the Lord started ministering to me with something I had read that morning. And then everything just kind of came at once. And uh, it was very heavy on my heart because this is something that I am learning currently. And um, I pray that it will encourage all of us and where we are with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, bear with me. Um, just by a show of hands. I do this a lot, but by show of hands, how many of you want to please the Lord? <laughs> Amen. I think all of us would say that. We want, to, we want to please the Lord. And there are so many promises in the Word of God about the people who please the Lord and who fear the Lord in the Old and New Testament all throughout, the one who, who pleases the Lord, um, and God blesses them. But we often associate the blessing of God or the favor of God with provision or with peace from our enemies or, uh, um, you know, rest from our circumstances or, um, you know, promotion in our job or promotion in our ministry or promotion in some way, shape, or form. That's what we consider the blessing of the Lord. And God does bless his children, absolutely, absolutely. Does God pour out his, his spirit? Does he provide? Absolutely. But something that I've come to uh, uh, begin, that I'm beginning to learn, is that the blessings of the Lord are not attached to what I do. Now, that doesn't mean you can live however you want. And, oh, God's going to bless me. I can live this life however I want. No, that's not how it works. But, when God blesses you, if you are a child of God, it is because you are his child, not because of what you do. And I've, I've learned that more since I became uh, a new dad. Uh, my son doesn't have to do anything for me to want to bless him. He can't do anything for me. In fact, I have to do everything for him. Well, more faith. It's like 80-20. She's 80%. 20% with the baby. But... Whatever faith and I do for him, it's purely by nature that he's our son. 
So that's where the blessing of the Lord comes from. Now, the other side of that is that, that's what we equate with, oh, God's pleased with us. Things are going well. And in reading Scripture and in my personal time with the Lord, I found something quite the opposite that God does when he is pleased with you. So the name of this message is called Well Pleased With You. I want God to be well pleased with me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So our core scripture for the evening is the last two verses of Matthew chapter 3 into the first verse of Matthew chapter 4. And it reads like this. This is the New International Version. It says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I read that, and because Scripture, the way it's written out in modern times and modern Bibles, the, the original uh, uh, scrolls and stuff were not separated by chapter or verse, uh, but we kind of did that to help us like get thoughts from the Word. Okay, this is a complete thought. That's a chapter, right? That's what God is speaking in this section. But immediately, two verses following each other in Scripture is, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And the very next verse is, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I've struggled with this as a Christian like all of us, that we've all suffered in some way, shape, or form. But how can those two verses go back to back? How can God be well pleased with you and then send you into the wilderness? To me, that didn't make any sense. But as I spend more time with the Lord, I see that if he is pleased with you, that is exactly where he will lead you. In the wilderness, in the desert, to be alone. And we're going to explore why tonight. The first point, if anyone is taking notes, I want to leave you with. If the Lord is pleased with you, he will call you to walk his road. God doesn't ask you to do anything that he himself did not do. Matthew 16, verse 24 to 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. When God is pleased with you, there's a, there's a path that Jesus walked while he was on this earth. And because he was in human flesh, the Bible even says that, that he needed to be made perfect, a perfect high priest. That's why all the temptations, that's why all the struggles Jesus went through, that when he died on that cross, he was made a perfect high priest in God's sight so that he could be the atonement for our sins. And in the same way, as God's children, now by Jesus' blood, by the blood that he shed, he invites us to walk in that road. I watched a few videos today of um, Navy SEAL training. And I watched a couple of videos uh, of drill sergeants Right, you know those guys that are screaming like, "Go, give me twenty!" Awesome. And, that, and they're like screaming at the guys, and the guys are like trying to wake up out of bed. And I saw the intensive training that soldiers go through, but specifically Navy SEALs. Those are a very when you when you ever hear about a Navy SEAL, you're like, "Whoa!" Like that guy's got a license to kill. I better treat him very nice. <laughs> he can take me out. There's a, a, a level of respect and awe that I have for Navy SEALs because in order to become a Navy SEAL, you, you can't just be a Navy SEAL. You, you can't just, oh yeah, yeah, I wanna be a Navy SEAL, sign me up. You sign up, they're like, okay, that sounds good. And then they, they, they oh, I, I forget the name, there, there's, uh, uh, I think it's uh, called SUBS, and there's a, is it SUBS or, or, or BUS or something like that? They have an acronym where they take you to this specific place in the country. 
and they put these soldiers through the most intensive training that any soldier can possibly go through. And I, I, uh, one of the videos I watched was a, a Marine. They put a Marine to, to, to see if he can complete the Navy SEAL training program or, or the, the qualification round at least because there's a qualification round and then you go into weeks of the most intense training. And he failed at one of them. This is a Marine, right? Marines already are like up here. And even he, he couldn't finish all of the tasks needed to become a Navy SEAL. The reason I'm even bringing all of that up, how are those soldiers formed? How do they become Navy SEALs? Well, people that have been in that intense training before them train them to then become a Navy SEAL. And those people were trained by someone else, and the people that trained them were trained by somebody else. And they're put through the most intense training. Why? Why do the instructors do that to them? Because then when they go out in the battlefield, they know how to encounter the obstacles that they're going to come up against. Right? Navy SEALs go through the most intensive training. They, 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 they put them in like the most frigid water for like extended periods of time. I saw this one, um, uh, this one uh, uh, exercise where the, the SEALs are, have weight belts and they're crawling on the bottom of a pool floor. And the instructor comes from the top dives down and starts ripping out their equipment. And if they come up to the surface, they're disqualified. It's very intense training. Why? They, they called it, as one, one of the Navy SEALs called it a shark attack. He, he was describing what they do, and they come down and they pull out your, your air supply. They rip the goggles from your eyes. They do all of that. And your goal is, while you're down there, you have to figure out how to get yourself back together. Still being underwater, holding your breath. Why? It's pretty cruel, doesn't it? But in order to become the soldier that will, that, that will be able to fulfill the most specialized of tasks, that kind of training is required. Now, that was a very long explanation. Going, I went a little too down a rabbit hole with Navy SEALs. But going back to our walk with Christ, if you want to switch the mic, Okay, um, if in your walk with Christ, if you want to be someone, like the disciples changed the world. The disciples brought the gospel to the entire world and it started with 12 men. If you want God to use you, if you want to be useful for the kingdom of God, then you got to walk the road that Jesus walked. He's not going to put you through training and through difficulty and bring you into the wilderness that he himself did not go through. Jesus went through it and he became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. The reason he calls us into the wilderness, if he's pleased with you, is so that he can make you like himself. He will call you to walk in his way. Thank you. Hello. Is that better? Amen. He will call you to walk his road because he knows the training that you have to endure in order to survive in this life. Because life is a trip. How many say amen? <laughs> life can be a trip. So if the Lord is pleased with you, he will invite you to walk his road. He knows your heart already, but your heart needs to be tested. And when he calls you to walk his road, he, you're formed like him. You are formed more and more like Jesus. Number two, if the Lord is pleased with you, he will lead you into the desert where he is. A lot of times we envision the Lord and, and, and we, we read Psalm 23. He leads me beside quiet waters and, and, and green pastures, right? And something that I learned about green pastures and still waters, in Israel... What's considered a green pasture to most people looks like a desert. And there are just little patches of green. But that's considered a green pasture. And the sheep have to stay with the shepherd. And what, I was like, what? That doesn't look like a green pasture. But a, a, a skillful shepherd knows where the food is for the sheep. But it's, it's in, located in the wilderness. So if the Lord is pleased with you, he will lead you into the desert where he is. Going back to our core scripture, Matthew 3 says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, 
He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. There is no greater training ground for the Christian than the barren wasteland, the sun-scorched desert, or the lonely wilderness. It is only there where true faith is formed. And we see that in the life of David. It was a peculiar verse that I read not too long ago, but it's found in 1 Samuel. We're going to read a little bit of it. It's 1 Samuel 23, the second part of 24 into verse 29. Meanwhile, David and his men had moved into the wilderness of Maon in the Arab Valley south of Jeshimon. When David heard that Saul and his men were searching for him, he went even farther into the wilderness to the great rock, and he remained there in the wilderness of Maon. But Saul kept after him in the wilderness. Saul and David were now on opposite sides of a mountain. Just as Saul and his men began to close in on David and his men, an urgent message reached Saul that the Philistines were raiding Israel again. So Saul quit chasing David excuse me, and returned to fight the Philistines. Ever since that time, the place where David was camped has been called the Rock of Escape. David then went to live in the strongholds of En Gedi. The place that came to be known as a famous place where David set up camp and resided, the rock of escape it was called, was located in the wilderness, deep in the wilderness. It says in verse 25, when David heard that Saul and his men were searching for him, he went even farther into the wilderness to the great rock. The Bible says that the rock of our salvation is Jesus Christ. The rock of your salvation, guess where he is? Deep in the wilderness. But the deeper you go, you'll come to a place where God will establish you. You don't think God would establish you in the desert, do you? But he established David. And the place where God had established David became famous and was given a name called Rock of Escape. The more Saul chased David, the further into the wilderness he went, but Saul couldn't lay a hand on David because David was heading toward the Rock of Escape. So the further that the enemy pushes you into the wilderness, if you let the Lord uh, do it in you, the further the enemy pushes you into the wilderness, the closer you will be brought to Jesus. And he will establish you there in a dry and weary land. He will be your water. He will be your food, everything you need, deep in those dry places. Amen? Listen, those dry places have a purpose. If the Lord is pleased with you, he leads you into the desert. What happens in a desert? There's no food or water. What do you feel? You're hungry. You're thirsty. Without that desert, I, I, I remember, this is a very small thing, but we're used to hot water here in the States. And when me and my wife and our baby boy went to Puerto Rico a couple months ago, the showers there are famous for not having hot water. <laughs> and I, I felt the lack of, of not having hot water and begin to appreciate it, right? When you don't have it, you, 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 you realize what you had. And in the desert where God leads you, that is where a thirst and a hunger for the Lord is built. And it can only be built there. Because if not, you'll stay comfortable where you are, where there's plenty. But when God leads you into the desert, that focus on him, all of a sudden, the Lord becomes all that you're looking for and all that you need. And it's only in the desert. Listen to Psalm 63, verse 1. And this is crazy. I didn't know this was in the intro, but I kept it in there because this is the Word of God. A Psalm of David, when he was in the desert of Judah, and this is what it says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. 
My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I would rather be hungry and thirsty in the safety of the presence of the Lord than well-fed and having to deal with Saul by myself. God's safe places are not where we think they are. When we envision green pastures and still waters, it's not rolling mountain hills that are just green all over. I watched a video of a, of a man showing in Israel what a green pasture looks like. It looks like a wilderness, but you see little patches of green that a, a skilled shepherd knows to lead the sheep to. It's where God says the safe place is, and it's in the desert. I saw a video. Uh, Billy Graham was speaking, and he recalled a, a conversation he had with his mom. And I wrote it down, and this is exactly what he said during a sermon. He said, my mother is here tonight, and I remember when I was in school, I wrote to her one day many years ago. She's forgotten. And I said, mother, you know, for the last few weeks, I haven't been able to get anywhere in my prayers, and I don't feel Christ. And she said, son, you have accepted Christ as your Savior, and whether you have feeling or not, the moments that you don't feel anything are the moments when he may be the closest because that's the moment when you must walk by sheer faith and God may be testing you. How can that not be in the wilderness? How can that not be God leading you? Because it's there the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. So if God leaves you into the wilderness, if you're going to be a true follower of Christ, if God loves you, which he does, and he is pleased with you, if you are walking in his ways, oh, everything's going to be fine. No, he will take you and bring you into the desert so that you learn to walk by faith. And then why does he do that? Why would God do such a thing? So that no matter what life throws at you, and no matter what you feel, whether you feel his awesome, glorious presence or you feel a million miles, your faith will stand. Because you're not depending on what you feel, you're not depending on what you see, you're depending on the God who said he would never leave me. I may feel abandoned, but he's always with me. The Bible says we are pressed, we are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are persecuted. But we are not abandoned, struck down, but we are not destroyed. How many say amen? The third thing, if the Lord is pleased with you, expect opposition. Christians are like a virus in the world. And the world and Satan and his demons are the white blood cells. And we're a poison. So if we're really following Christ, we better believe the enemy's coming to attack. You have to be prepared for that. I know it's quiet, but we're going to get to that. Where th there's hope in this. This is just the signs that God is pleased with you. And it happens to be the wilderness. Listen, Matthew 3, verse 17, through chapter 4, the first part of verse 3. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him. What? When you fast, shouldn't that mean the enemy stays away? When you're all prayed up, shouldn't that mean the enemy's far from you? Mm-mm. The enemy's attracted. It's, it's like, th think of it this way. A fly, they, they, they fly in your house, they go all over the place, right? But when a light's turned on, that fly goes right for the light. And that's what Satan does. When there's light, Satan comes immediately. Immediately. He even came to Jesus, the Son of God. And Jesus even told us about this in John 15. And he said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. If they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you too. That's something that a lot of Christians don't want to talk about. Right? Because it doesn't sound good. 
But that's what Jesus said. Jesus didn't sugarcoat anything. He said, if you belong to me, they're going to come for you. But then he tells us, fear not, for I have overcome the world. And the one who overcame the world and Satan and death and the grave and sin now lives in me. And he will overcome and lead me safely home. How many say amen? Amen. But I struggle with this question every day, church. Why is it that way? Why does it take suffering? Why is sometimes it so hard that you don't know how you're going to wake up the next day? God, why would you do it this way? Because suffering here crucifies the flesh. It kills the thing that wants to keep you away from God until all that's left is the life of Christ in you. The flesh is no more, and Christ can freely live in you to change the world and bring people into the kingdom of God. (laughs) Romans 5, verse 3 to 4 says this, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 1 Peter 4, verse 12 to 14 Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. Going back to, go back to the, the Navy SEAL analogy We're going to close very soon. Um, A Navy SEAL, they go through all that training, that vigorous beating of themselves so that they have the privilege of being called a Navy SEAL. They have the privilege of being sent on the most dangerous missions to serve their country. And the world will tell you every other kind of suffering is good. You work out. Those of you that work out in here, what are you doing when you lift weights? Or what are you doing when you run? You're putting your heart under stress. When you lift weights, you're tearing your muscles so that they will grow. The world will support any of those kind of sufferings that will lift you up. But the kind of suffering that God wants from us does away with this, the flesh, and it glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, but that still doesn't answer why does it take suffering, right? It kills the flesh, but why else? We're stubborn and we'll forget the Lord. I encourage everybody, when you go home, read Deuteronomy 8. It'll change. God did everything. He's bringing Israel into the promised land, but a word that he gave them was do not forget the Lord. Remember how he brought you out of Egypt, how he took you through the wilderness, how he fed you manna in the desert. And this is why at the end of it, it's not going to be on the screen. He says he ga- it says he gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known. Why? To humble and test you so that in the, so that in the end it might go well with you. We don't think this, but if God blesses you too much, you'll forget the Lord. We all will. If trials and everything don't come, we'll forget the Lord. Um. Proverbs 30 talks about it. It's not on the screen. But the, guy, the, the man that was writing that proverb, he said, Lord, don't do this for me. He said, don't give me too much or too little. Give me only what I need. He said, if I have too much, I might forget who you are and say, who is the Lord? Right? Because then you start to depend on you. Right? So we're stubborn and we'll forget the Lord. Too many blessings will drive us away from the Lord. 
And suffering teaches us obedience. So we will walk in the right way, just like a father or mother disciplined their child. Psalm 119, verse 71, it says this, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. And this is what's crazy. Jesus, the Son of God, in the book of Hebrews, it says this about Jesus. It says that he learned obedience through what he suffered. What? Jesus put himself in a position where he needed to learn, even though he knew everything. And it was through the vehicle of suffering that he learned obedience. And because he obeyed everything that the Father told him, even against his own will. You guys remember when Jesus prayed in the garden? He said, Father, if it pleases you, take this cup away, yet not as I will, as you will. And because he went to the cross, we're standing here today. Forgive him. Amen? Suffering and hardship teach us about God's heart. Go back and read Philippians 2. You see the heart of Christ. It says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, becoming obedient even to death on a cross. Therefore, God, gave, God raised him up and gave him the name that is above every name. God will lift you up. And this is the last thing, and then we're going to pray. Once you have stood the test and have resisted the devil, have resisted the enemy, God will come and rescue you. Matthew 4, verse 8 to 11. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 to 10. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. It's the training ground. The wilderness is the training ground of the Lord. If you are in the desert right now, if you feel like your prayers aren't hitting the ceiling, if you feel like you're reading the Word faithfully every day, you're opening the Word of God and you're not getting anything, God is creating a hunger and thirst inside of you that the world can't satisfy. But you'll only come to that place in the wilderness. And Jesus himself, when he took on flesh, he went there for us. He went in the wilderness too. So don't be discouraged, son or daughter of God. After you have suffered a little while, after all of this is gone, God will restore you. He just wants to make you like himself. Why? Because he wants to make a name for himself? No, he's God. He doesn't need anything. But because your life will count while you're here. And lives will be saved. And God will be able to use you. But it takes, it takes the wilderness. I've been in the wilderness a couple of times in my short 25 years of life. And it's the time where I fell in love with Jesus more than anything. Nothing else mattered. Not even that he delivered me. But just the fact that I knew him. He brought me through. And I know he will bring you through too. Amen. 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 Wow. You know, I love... Uh, the Bible because it's the truth. You know, some people who speak try to clean up the word. They don't want to tell you all those dark little secrets that they think are dark, but they're a light. 
Jesus didn't say, and you shall know the fluff, and the fluff will set you free. He said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That is the truth, right? Because we can make believe that everything is okay, and but really, we've been, how many have been in the wilderness? Raise your hand if you've been in the wilderness. Oh, it's not easy, is it? It's not. But it's true. You do go there. You need to know what to do when you're there. You need to know that it's not time to despair. It's not time to give up. It's not time to think that God has left you. No, he is not. The truth of the matter is that God is in the wilderness, and it's there that he forms you. Oh, I, I shudder to think where I would be if I hadn't been through wilderness in my life. So then I could do what the Bible says and thank God for it. Otherwise, where would I be? And what would I be thinking and what would I be doing? Amen. The truth sets us free. Right now, I think we need to pray for each other. I know there's some folks going through things here. And this is a word for you. It's a word for me too. I'm encouraged in my heart. That no matter where I go, God is there waiting for me. The Bible says, where can I hide from your presence? If I go to the highest heights, you're there. If I go to the deepest depths, you're there. There's nowhere where God won't meet you if you're looking for him. Amen? Let's find prayer partners, men with men and women with men, women. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for each other for strength in the wilderness and for sight to see that God is there. Amen? Let's do that for a few moments.